All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for coming to creating accessible Word documents in Word. Uh, my name is Rianne LaPere. I am the Braille and Accessibility Testing Coordinator, Coordinator at NELS, and I'm also um, involved with the Accessible Libraries Project. And uh, we're so excited that everyone has joined us for this exciting webinar. Before we get started, a few video conference housekeeping details to minimize distractions. Please keep your microphone muted for the duration of the webinar unless it's your turn to speak. Um, we have everybody muted and they do have to ask for permission to talk and we do have to allow people to talk. Um, and if you are speaking, please keep background noise to a minimum. Um, please use the chat for questions um, or the Q&A and the raise hand feature um, and other important messages rather than a water cooler. Um, excessive chat notifications can become quite disruptive for many participants, especially those using screen readers. So we do ask that you keep chat to a minimum. Um, and then there, of course, is the Q&A. So if you have a question, we can certainly put those up there or through the chat either is fine um and there will be breaks in between each little section for questions so you don't have to save them all to the end you can do some after each section and then there'll be a time at the end for for general questions as well uh, the slides from today's webinar and a handout will be posted on accessiblelibraries.ca including any links and all links will be posted in the chat during the presentation um, please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on accessiblelibraries.ca via our YouTube channel. Um, and our presenters today come from across this land, living and working in what we now know as, know as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples and will continue to honour the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to Indigenous nations and peoples. We respectfully ask for you all to take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which you reside. Our wonderful presenter today is Rachel Oselin. She is a production coordinator at NELS, where she runs all in-house production and training for accessible formats, including Doc EPUB 3, Daisy Text and Daisy Audio. She trains and supervises the production assistants who reformat digital books into accessible formats for patron requests and awards programs. She also works with publishers in training and creating image descriptions and accessible documents. Rachel is proud to be a part of the NELS team helping create an equitable future for all readers in Canada. She holds her MLIS from the University of Alberta and is also a freelance writer. And what all that goes to say is there is no one better to be giving this presentation and webinar training for you today. I hope you enjoy and Rachel, take it from here. Thank you, Rianne, for the introduction. Um, and before I begin, um, I would like to have my own land acknowledgements. I am on the city of Hamilton, which is situated upon the traditional territories of the, the Erie Neutral, Huron-Wendant, Haudenosaunee <clears throat> and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ashiniabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. I further acknowledge that this land is covered by, by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the first of the Credit First Nation. Today, the Hamilton, city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. And we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. I also encourage you, talking to all you guys, <laughs> to explore the website nativeland.ca, where you can learn more about whose land you are living and the history of their people. So again, thank you for attending today's presentation. As Rianne has mentioned, my name is Rachel Oslin and I've been working with NELS for the past five years. Today, in fact, is my five year anniversary. So I'm really excited to share this milestone with you doing something I'm really passionate about, which is sharing information on accessibility. So during this presentation, I will be introducing you to different features you can apply to your Word document for better accessibility. I will be giving a live demo for each feature 
followed, which is preceded and followed by a short video clip that shows how screen readers interact with these features. After we finish the last video for each section, um, that will be a time where we'll do a quick pause, as Rianne has mentioned, for questions related directly to the demonstration. So this is, yeah, this is a short pause, but please don't stress out. We have the Q&A at the end, as Rianne already mentioned, so we will get to your questions. And um, yeah. So I will briefly walk you through accessible PDF creation, and I'll also show you um, how to save your document as PDF. And the reason I'm doing this is because PDFs are very popular document formats. Okay. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I just wanna have a note about software. So before I begin, I'd like to note that during this presentation, I'll be giving live demos using Mac with MS Word version 16.58 with Microsoft 365. There are some slight variations between Mac and Windows when it comes to interacting with Word, and I will highlight those differences when they come up. We will also be providing you with additional information on all the instructions for Mac and Windows after this presentation, so don't worry about that. You will get that information. I am also aware that there are other types of software that you may be using to create your documents. We have chosen to focus this presentation on MS Word that is the most compatible with creating a fully accessible document. You can use the recommendations within this presentation and apply them to other software as noted on the slide, but just be aware that it may not create the same quality of document as if you work with MS Word. I do understand that we are limited with the software that we use within our organizations. So I just wanted to make note of that. So now we're gonna get to the good stuff. Using Word to create an accessible document. So before we can get started in creating an accessible document, we need to set up our workplace and assure that we are ready for success. This will include setting up the document print view, opening the style pane to build formatting, opening up the navigation pane to help track the headings. So I'm now gonna to switch to a live demo and show you how to get started. Don't worry, I'll be explaining how to use these, the styles later on. I'm just gonna show you how to open up the style pane. So. Alrighty. So the first thing I wanna do is change it to print view. It's good to set your document to print layout this way you can easily see the boundaries of the page and it's easier to create the layout for your document. This is super simple to do. What I wanna do is I wanna to go to the home tab at the top here in my ribbon menu. Um, and then I wanna go over to view tab actually, yeah, view tab. And then I just hit the print layout. Automatically you can see a really big difference. I see the borders of the page um, which can be really helpful when I'm setting up the formatting. And then on the same tab, I can also change like the zoom. So right now it's set up to one page. One page is good if you're like doing like just formatting and you just wanna make sure that the, the layout looks nice. But if you're doing something a little more detailed also for the sake of this presentation, so you can see things, we're gonna go with page width and that is just gonna be the width of the screen. So next we wanna open the navigation pane. So this is a map of the structure in terms of the heading styles that have been applied to the Word document. The map provides a quick means of navigating to different headings and will help you as you build your heading structure in your documents. So again, we're in the view tab of the home, I'm sorry, of the Word ribbon. And we're gonna to go to this section here. It has ruler guidelines and navigation pane, and we're just gonna select navigation pane. That's gonna open up a window on the left side of our workspace. This is a point that looks a little bit different on Windows, um, but it works the same way. On Windows, you'll see like a hyperlink word saying heading. You're gonna select heading. For Mac, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the second tab here, which says document map and we're gonna click that. On Windows and on my Mac here, this map 
the navigation pane is going to be empty because this is where our headings are and right now there are no headings styled in this document. This is a really important part of formatting. It also can actually be really good for you if you're doing um, reports and you're sharing reports with people internally, because uh, this works as a navigation as well for you. And I will show that to you a little later on. So the next thing we're gonna open is the style pane. The style pane is where most of the magic happens in creating an accessible document. It's a really fun place. Don't worry. If you've never been in style pane before, it can seem a little intimidating, but it's a lot easier than you, you think. You're gonna just get into the flow of it. So here we can apply and manage styles. And again, I'm gonna be talking about that a little later on with styles, but we're just gonna open it up right now. So to open the style pane, we wanna to go to the home tab. Okay, I'm going to point a few things out on the home tab before I open up the style pane. First is this section here to the left, which has like how you can change the fonts and add bold and underline and all that jazz. That's what we call direct formatting. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The style pane is beside it. First, you have a style gallery. And then in Mac, there's a button that says style pane. In Windows, it's just a little arrow right beside the gallery. So we just click that and like magic, a window opens up on the right side of our work screen. Okay, I'm gonna show some quick things about this right now. The style pane at the top, we have current style. That just means where your cursor is at that moment, right? So that's a normal style. You have a button to create a new style, then you have select all, you have the apply style, and then you have this display window that will show all styles. Now, again, the style pane is gonna look a little different in Windows, but we're gonna be sending some supporting documentation about that. So don't worry, they work the same. In Mac, I have a drop down menu at the bottom here that says list. Right now it's set to styles in use, but if I go to all styles, I can show you I like to think for a minute, take a sip of my coffee. These are all the styles that are in the Word document. These are kind of like all the styles that are within Word that come with Word. This is also, if you get to the point where you know how to create your own templates, and again, we won't have time to go into templates today. I am mentioning it though, because I know a lot of people do work with templates. If you have a style template this, and you upload it to your document, it will appear here as well. And one thing I do recommend too, is if you are remediating a document, so you have a document that's already created, kind of like what we have here, I would recommend clearing all styles before you start building up the accessibilities to the document, just because um, it will ensure that there's no unwanted formatting that slips through the process. I mean, we're all human, right? So I'm gonna show you that really quickly. So you make sure your style pane is open and then you select all the text. On Mac, it's Command A on your keyboard. On PC, it's Control A. So I'm gonna hit Command A, selects everything. And then you just hit clear formatting, okay? If I go back into like my styles in use, it will show me that I only have two styles. So yeah, that is how you do that. I'm just gonna undo that just because we're gonna be doing some other fun magic in this a little later on, but that is one recommendation. All right, so I'm gonna go into direct formatting versus styles. A common accessibility mistake is to use direct formatting instead of words built in styles. So direct formatting is when you use the buttons and the ribbon to modify the fonts, style, size, and color. I showed you that a little earlier and I'll show you that again. So why is it bad? This creates text that's inaccessible, meaning a screen reader cannot read the text properly to know when there is an important feature in a document, such as a heading. There are expectations to use direct, there are ex, exceptions, sorry, exceptions to use direct formatting. They are only a couple. I will be talking about them one later on, um, which is lists um, and We'll also provide more information on that after the presentation as well. So styles, 
are the magical thing. Styles are basically a set of formatting characteristics that you apply to text, tables, and lists in your document to quickly change their appearance. They are the foundation for an accessible document. When you apply a style, you apply a whole group of formats in one simple task, and you can modify the formatting quickly and easily using the style pane. So not only is it easier to use styles compared to direct formatting, it's also obviously, spoiler alert, more acceptable. So style marks up the formatting in a way that adds additional meaning to the document. This markup is what we refer to as tagging. Um, so for example, a properly marked up heading uses the heading one style we create a tag for the screen reader that states heading one. So that tag, the heading one tag is what the screen reader will pick up and they'll know it's that it's a heading. The only time you would need to use direct formatting is when you're creating lists. Um, everything else should be created with styles. I'll be showing how to format lists later on in this presentation, as I mentioned before, but now let's learn a little bit more about styles. Again, this is just an introduction, okay? So through styles, you can modify not only font, spacing, indents, indents, and more, including creating your own template. I did mention this already. You can create a template for styles. That's gonna be a whole other presentation, but there, we do have resources we can share with you if you wanna get started on that. I'll only be giving, again, a brief introduction to working with styles for this presentation. Okay, and, then, and, all, and you can see on the slide here, there's all these really magical things that you can do with modifying your styles. So applying headings. Remember, headings are really important. Headings are actually the most important part of an accessible document. They are the main way a screen reader will navigate through the document. So you guessed it, we use styles to apply and modify headings. Remember the following when creating headings. Always use heading styles. Always follow the rule of hierarchy. Don't worry, I'm gonna explain that in a moment. Avoid split headings. Avoid empty spaces between headings. Never put headings in a text box and never put headings in a table for layout purposes. And again, we will talk more about this during accessible tables. So now I'm gonna tell you about the rules of hierarchy. So the rule of hierarchy is fairly straightforward. Only go up or down by one level in the hierarchy and never jump over a level. So never go level one to level three, okay? This will cause the reader to get confused and think they've missed something. Heading hierarchy, okay? So never go from like heading level one to like having level three, because that's gonna cause confusion and then the reader's gonna think that they missed something, cool? So on the slide here, I have, how the he heading hierarchy is listed. Heading one, top level, two, next level down, three can be used for subsections, four to six sub subsections. And four to six are really rarely used, but they are there. So remember having that split, having headings that split over two line or jump without content between them can cause what we call false navigation. So this will cause a screen reader to get lost and the reader will miss important information or become confused. So try to have content between each heading level. And even if it's only like a brief sentence, so a heading one immediately followed by having two can again lead to reading confusion. So for instance, it's like if you're creating like a report or something and it's like you got the heading one, that's like the top level name of the section, then you could just have a sentence being like, this is what this section is about. And then you go into heading two, just so you have something in between those two headings. So before we get into our live demo, I'm gonna play for you a video of Kai. Kai Lee is an accessible analyst at NELS. He tests eBooks, websites, and applications and works on tactile projects. Outside of work, he loves reading great books and practicing Krav Maga. In this video, he will walk us through what it's like for a screen reader to try and navigate headings that are not properly formatted for accessibility. So I'm just gonna play for this, you guys, this right now. Hi, my name is Kai. I'm an accessibility analyst at NELS. And in the following demos, I'll be showing you what the different elements in this document will sound like with a screen reader when it's properly formatted and improperly formatted. The first element we'll be looking at are headings. Headings are one of the most important parts of an accessible document. 
Below are four headings with bad formatting. Bad heading with direct formatting. In this first one, we are able to hear that the screen reader can read the text, but it still does not understand what the type of element is and that it's a heading. If we arrow up a couple times Full heading. and start reading. Headings are one of the most important parts of an accessible document. Below are four headings with bad formatting. Bad heading with direct formatting. Tape with. Hopefully you can hear that the text, including the heading, is just read as regular text. Next, let's look at the table. Table one, uniform table, new cell, bad heading with direct formatting in, table, subheading in table, row two of two, last cell in table. The screen reader is able to understand that we're in a table, but again, it still doesn't know that it's a heading. It's still reading the text as regular text. Not to mention, you're asking users to navigate this table like it's a data table, and in this context, it doesn't make much sense. Next, let's look at the text box. If I arrow down from here, Out of it completely skips it, so I have to manually find it. Blend, blend, table text box one. And when I do, the screen reader just reads text box one. So, go into our demo. All right. So, for this presentation, I'm mainly going to focus on headings for working with styles. Um, but there is more you can do with styles. But again, this is just an introduction presentation and headings are so very, very important. So first, let's deal with this table and text box situation, shall we? Um, we know from what Kai showed us that the text box heading is just not accessible at all. So I'm just gonna delete it. All right, then we know that the table for layout is also bad. Um, so just, ne just never use a table for layout purposes. And again, we're going to have a whole section on tables. So if you have any questions for tables, I'll be able to answer them then. So we're just going to delete the table. Come on. If my thing wants to work. There we go. My little laser is making things difficult to do things. I apologize, guys. There we go. My apologies. The little laser pointer is like making it kind of hard for me to interact with things, but I deleted the table. All right. So next we're gonna apply styles to these headings. Okay, so first I'm gonna go up to this first heading here. So I showed this before um, with the style pane, there's this current style section here. So you'll notice that when I have my cursor here, um, the heading kind of appears to be styled already. It says normal plus two points, bold, so on and so forth. But that was done with direct formatting, okay? And I know that because it's normal, which is the style plus the direct formatting. And again, that's a no, 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 okay? So we wanna apply and modify the style. So how do we do that? First, let's fix the style, okay? So you can use this method if you were making a mistake, if you apply to the style, um, or if you're in the situation, you're just going through line by line fixing things. So you'll need to clear the formatting first. Always clear the formatting before you apply a new style. And again, this just ensures that the style has been applied properly and doesn't cause any accessibility issues. So I'm going to select this by just triple clicking. Okay. I can also just drag and drop, you know, just select the text. And then I'm going to hit clear formatting. Okay. And then I'm gonna find the correct style in my apply style display, which is gonna be a heading one. I'm just gonna select heading one and bam, two things happen that are exciting. One, I just applied a heading and two, it popped up in my navigation pane. Isn't that beautiful? Another thing I wanna show you quickly is I'm just gonna clear this formatting is that you don't actually have to have for headings, 
You don't have to have the whole thing selected to apply the style. I could just have my cursor there at the end and hit the style and it will work. All right. So now let's do all the headings in here. So we've got this here, tables. I'm gonna clear formatting. And notice how it's building in my navigation pane, okay? There's another direct formatting that I don't want. I'm gonna clear heading one in my navigation pane. Let's go here, clear formatting, heading one. Again, clear formatting, heading one. Clear formatting, heading one. Clear formatting, heading one. Oh, look at that. And then like I said before, you can actually click on here and it will navigate around the document. So that's really fun too. So now that we have all our top headings, I wanna do a subheading for you. So I have this text that I already wrote for um, a subheading. I'm gonna make that heading two, okay? And you'll notice in the navigation pane, it's kind of like a collapsible menu here. It's one down, okay? So it's heading one, heading two. And I can navigate back and forth. And then when I have my cursor, it says heading one. When I have my cursor, it says heading one, okay? Also note that I have some text here, right? For the sample, just so when someone's reading this document, they'll know that they're, there's something going on between here and they haven't missed anything. But what if I wanna modify a style? Well, the fun part is you can do this with a modify styles and it will automatically apply the changes to all the instances of that style throughout your document. So you can modify the formatting of any style directly through the style pane again, okay? So let's go back to our style pane on the right here. We're gonna go into the display area for apply style. And if, as you tip your mouse and over all the styles and the names of the styles, you notice there's a little arrow that pops up on the far right. If we click that arrow, we select that arrow, it opens up a pop-up window for that particular style. And I'm gonna hit modify style, which is the second option on that menu. And that's gonna open a dialog box. Now, I'm not gonna go through everything in this dialog box. Again, styles could be its own presentation, but I'm just gonna go over this kind of quickly just to show you the basics. At the top here, we have the priorities. It's the name of the style, what the style is based on, so on and so forth. Formatting is where we're gonna be doing the modifying style. You notice there's a section right after the heading formatting that looks a lot like the direct formatting section of your ribbon menu. You can change the font style, size, you can apply bold, italics, underline, color, line spacing, spacing before and after paragraphs, indents. So there's a lot you can do here. Then there's a display window that shows you the changes. It's like a preview window. It's gonna show you the changes as you do it. And I'll show that to in a second. And then there's some text that's scrollable at the bottom underneath the, the display window that just shows you what's applied to that particular style. And then further down here under format, there's a whole bunch of options. So there's a really a lot you can do here. But right now, I'm just gonna change the color. So for accessibility, we recommend that you change the color to automatic whenever possible. We understand that that might not be possible if you're working with a template that has colors. I'm gonna talk about colors a little later on in the presentation, so don't you worry about that. I'm gonna add bold because it's fun, and I'm gonna do double space, okay? And I'm gonna hit, okay. And then if you scroll through, you'll notice all the headings have changed at the same time, heading once. So that's really exciting. So let's just do that one more time before we move on. I'm gonna modify now the heading two. So I go into my style pane. I find the title, the name for heading two style. I go to the little arrow on the far right. I click it and open up the pop-up window. I go to modify style, which is the second option open up that dialogue window. I go down to formatting. 
I'm going to change the color just for the sake of this presentation. I'm just going to change it to blue um, just so we can see that. I make sure that automatically update, add quick style, we're good to go. We don't have to add the template if we're not making a template. Then I hit OK, and now it's blue. So before we go, I just want to show you just two other styles we can use, OK? So here I have a word bold and the word italic, and it's done with direct formatting. Again, remember, we want to avoid direct formatting. So I'm just going to highlight those two words. I'm going to clear formatting. Then I'm going to highlight the word bold. Oops. And then I'm going to scroll down in my style pane until I hear strong. Strong is the style that's the same as bold. And select that. Okay. So now it says strong. So see, I go here, it says normal in the style, current style. If I go to the bold, now it says strong. Then I'm going to select italic and I'm going to go emphasis. Okay. So now in my document, I have normal style, which is used, recommended for like just sort of like paragraph text and regular text, heading two, heading one, emphasis and strong, okay? So now that we've played a little bit with styles and fixing up our heading, let's go back to the slides and watch one more video for Kai about good heading, and then we can get to some questions. So what does a properly formatted heading sound like? Out of table, land. Heading level one goes heading level one with styles. As you've just heard, the screen reader reads the text of the heading, but it also tells us that it's a heading and that it's a level one heading, which is important when we're talking about heading structure or heading hierarchy. Heading hierarchy allows the user to understand how the document is laid out. And because this is a heading that the screen reader can recognize, it also allows the screen reader to be able to jump from heading to heading. Quick keys on. Heading two goes heading level two with styles. Heading one bold and italics the S strong and emphasis. Heading two goes heading level two with styles. Heading one goes heading level one with styles. So the takeaway for this is to make sure you're using heading styles because the screen reader then is able to report that it's a heading and to use good heading hierarchy. So not skipping levels and using lower level headings for major sections and higher level, so level two, three, four, et cetera, for subsections so that the user understands the structure of the document. All righty, thank you recording of Kai. That was awesome. So now we are gonna go into creating accessible tables. <laughs> this one is really important. I mean, it's all important. Um, so when tables are not structured for accessibility, the data they contain can quickly become a meaningless sea of numbers, facts, and figures. All right, an accessible table is only, only for tabular data. That data can be understood in a table format, it has a logical reading order from left to right and top to bottom, it is correctly formatted so a screen reader can easily navigate through the data, and an accessible table needs to include a clear and formatted heading row, no empty cells. Just, and I'll show you how to do this, and a description in the title. It needs to be noted that often complex tables can be simplified by breaking them into multiple simple tables with a heading above each, um, and non-tabular data can be presented in paragraphs, list, or comma, co columns, excuse me. For example, an agenda is really good to be structured as a list and never as a table. And don't worry, I'm going to be showing lists right after I go through tables. So tables are often misused and not formatted correctly. So again, don't worry, guys, I got you. That is why I'm here talking to you today. So let's briefly go over what not to do when, we come to, when it comes to tables, OK? Do not create page layouts with tables. Do not create a table without a header row. Do not merge or split cells. Do not create your table using draw table tool. Do not control spacing with your table with blank rows or columns. Adjust line spacing instead. 
spoiler alert, you can all, you know, styles. Do not have empty cells. Cells without data can be filled with either a dash or an N slash A. So before we go into another live demo on how to create an accessible table, you guessed it guys, we're gonna go back to Kai and he is gonna walk us through bad tables. Next, let's talk about properly formatted tables and improperly formatted tables. Here we have an example of the improperly formatted one. When I navigate a table, I use screen reader specific commands to go from cell to cell, row to row, column to column. And when I do this now, level one, bullet this is text for activity A and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Bullet this is text for activity B and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Bullet this is I'm getting a big chunk of information. Same with if I go to the right. Level zero. It doesn't really make much sense in a list like this. Not to mention this is a non-uniform table, so it's a little bit harder to develop a mental model using this particular structure. Next, let's talk about- Thank you, Kai. So it's that time again, guys. We're gonna go back into the live demo and we're gonna create an accessible table together. I know you're just as excited as I am. All right. I might have to turn, turn off my little laser pointer because I remember earlier it was causing me some issues with the table, but we'll see how it goes. It's all good. So let's go to the tables. Yay. So again, here's the example. This is a table and it has a few things wrong with it. And Kai just went through this bad table. This is a naughty table. And then below I have my good table, okay? So one thing I wanna point out, and again, don't worry guys, I will explain this to you in more detail, is I took this top section here, the purpose. This wasn't like, this is, it's supposed to be a list, right? A nice rule of thumb when you're remediating or creating a document is that if it's a list, format it as a list, right? And I know it can be kind of difficult, especially if like you're used to like writing like in like APA or MLA styles or what have you, um, where you can make a list in a, in a, in a sentence, um, but making all lists in as like formatted as lists is actually better for accessibility. So I took that and I made a list, okay? Uh, and I, again, I will show you how to do that a little later on. So this is what my good list, my good um, table looks like when I'm done. I got my heading row and don't worry, in a couple moments, we're actually gonna do this ourselves. Here are all my data. Then I have a blank cell right here and see, I decided to use a little dash, okay? So let's just do that ourselves. I'm actually gonna turn off my spotlight for this if I can just because it causes functionality issues. Okay, so to create an accessible table, we're gonna to go to the insert tab on the ribbon menu, okay? So let's go up to our ribbon menu up at the top here. I'm at home. The next one to the right is insert. So I'm gonna select insert and I'm gonna to go to table. It's the fourth option from the left. And I'm gonna open this up add a table. And this opens up a pop-up sort of window that has all these little boxes. And as I move my mouse over these boxes, I can see like how many rows and columns I want to do. Okay, so you want to choose the number of boxes you want across to create columns, then choose the number of boxes you want to create rows going down for your table. In this demo, I will only create part of the table. So it's gonna be smaller. So let's do two columns and four rows. So two columns and four rows. Magic. All right, we're cooking with fire guys. So now I want you to note that when you add a table to your document, two new tabs appear in the ribbon, design and layouts. These are the table tools. So I'm gonna to go up to the ribbon here, table design and layout. 
they are going to be the last two options on your ribbon menu. But I'm going to show you a little thing to note so you don't panic. If I'm right now, my cursor is in the table and I can see those table design things, options in the ribbon menu. If I go out of the table, you'll notice that they, they disappear. You can only access those tabs when you are inside the table. Okay, guys? So I know with me, especially when I'm learning something or if I haven't had enough coffee in the day, I have like weird little panics over silly things. This is something I'd have a panic about. So there you go. So on the design tab, there on the left here, these are your table style option group and it's two rows three options each, okay? And you wanna make sure that heading row is selected. That's the most important thing, heading row, header row, okay? Now your table essentially has a header row if that is selected, okay? So, and first column, if you guys are wondering what first column means, that means that it's gonna be reading an order from first column over. So it'll be reading order left to right. So that's a good thing to have too. So next we want to add text to your table in the column headings. Okay. So I'm just going to scroll up here. That was activity and cost. So I'm going to write in activity and cost. Okay. So having a heading row and having like clear like names for each heading, it's gonna make it easier to understand the information that the table contains. So some screen readers can be set up to read column names at all at the same time, which can help when working with a larger table. What I mean by that is that like in the, say this, say this table had like 50 rows and I was using a screen reader and I had it set up to under to read the column for every row. That means even if I'm down at row 30 or 45, I will know I'm in the cost column every time. Okay. So now we're going to enter some data into this blank, these blank cells. I'm just going to cut and paste just for expediency. So we're just going to copy that. I'm going to paste it there. And I'm going to copy this. Because you know, tables need data, right guys? And you can just type this. Everything else is pretty straightforward. And then we're gonna do a total down here. And then, okay. So I'm gonna have this be a blank cell. So remember, we can't have blank cells in a table for accessibility purposes. It's the same thing with not having like um, nothing between two headings. It basically just means, it just guarantees that the screener knows that that's supposed to be a blank cell and they don't get lost or stuck, okay? So I can do a dash, pretty straightforward, or I can do an n slash a, all right? So we just have two more steps to go through and then we have a beautiful finished table. So the next thing I wanna do is to ensure repeat header rows is enabled. I would recommend doing this even if the table does not go over multiple pages. So to enable repeat header rows, you're gonna place your cursor anywhere in the, in the table, okay? In the first row of the table right here. And we're going to right click and that's gonna open up a pop-up window, uh, menu, sorry. We're gonna scroll down to table priorities near the bottom. It's third from the bottom. We're gonna select table priorities and that's gonna open up a dialogue box for table priorities. Very exciting, guys. You have five options for table priorities. There's tabs at the top, table, row, column, cell, and alt text. Right now we're interested in row. So we're gonna select row. And then we're gonna make sure that repeat as a header row at the top of each page is selected. Okay. 
So again, table priorities, row tab, make sure you select repeat as a header row at the top of each page, and then we hit okay. Now we definitely have that. So if this goes over multiple pages, it will repeat on the multiple pages, which is really helpful. So the next thing I wanna do is I want a description, uh, table description. So description and title should always be included to give context to the table. Description should answer the question, what is the table's purpose and how is it organized? For example, a breakdown of the project costs and funding separated by columns for name and price would be a good description of this example. Remember to keep the description short and direct. A good guideline is to keep it around 140 words. So we're gonna do the same thing as we did before, guys. We're gonna make sure our cursor is in the table. We're gonna right click, to open up that menu. We're gonna to go to table priorities. In the dialog box, we're gonna to go to alt text. Sometimes this says um, description depending on the version of words you're using, but it's always the last tab. So there's a couple things here. First, we have the title text box. Right below the title text box, we have description text box. And then below that, there is a lovely set of directions on titles and descriptions and why they're good for disability. So that is fun. So then we just enter a title. Then we enter a description. And then once we have those and we're happy with them, we hit OK. Okay, and again, titles and descriptions, these are for screen readers and just adds a layer of accessibility, okay? Now, the last thing I'm gonna show you um, is going to be caption, okay? Now, not all tables require captions, but just in case you have a table that does require a caption, I'm gonna show you how to do it because it can be a little, if you don't know how to do it, you can get a little confusing. But once you know how to do it, it's not confusing, okay? So captions for tables always go above the table. So if I was to be right here, um, my cursor in the table and I right click, I don't have anything here for insert caption, okay? And this is why I'm saying things get finicky. What I wanna do is I wanna select the whole table. And the way I do that is you have these little like right here, these little guide box here that's being annoying and not working. Sorry guys, it's being weird. There we go. You wanna select the guide box, oh, there we go. So you see when my mouse is over it and I have the little crosshairs, Mine's being really finicky today, but I found it. There it is. If I click that, it selects the whole table. And then I right click and it says insert caption. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over that one more time for you guys, okay? If I'm just in the table and I open up my menu, I can insert the caption. But if I go to these little guide boxes here and I have the crosshairs and then I select that and it highlights the whole table and then I right click, I'll get insert caption, okay? I'm gonna go over the insert caption really quickly. Um, I'm gonna go through captions more when we get to um, images, sorry. So caption, you can have the text box to do your caption, the options, you have labels that you can use. We're gonna use table. You can create new labels. I'll show that to you when we're talking about images. The thing I really want you to know is position and you want it above the selected item. I do recommend having a label because it keeps things organized and helps screen readers know where they are. The number will automatically go up as you add more tables to your document. So this is a caption, just write it right directly in there, hit okay, and there it is. And then another thing I want you to see right before we're finished 
is let's look at this style pane again. Woohoo! I got caption style. That's right, guys. Caption is a style. That means we can modify it. And I will show you how to modify that a little later on. But we just went through a lot of information. So I'm going to show a quick demo from Kai about good tables, and then we're going to take your questions. Next, let's look at the properly formatted table. Total. Out of table. Heading, heading level three purpose. Heading level two good heading with accessible table. This table is great. Now. Quick keys on. Table three. Uniform table. New cell. I can tell that this is already a better table because it's a uniform table. Of course, it's possible to navigate tables that are non-uniform, but it's way easier to mentally, visually, uh, spatially figure out how it's laid out when everything is neat like this. This is text for activity A and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Row two of nine. This is text for activity B and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Row three of nine. So I'm just going down the column here. This is text for activity C and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Row four of nine. Now let's go to the right. Cost. Dollar two thousand point oh oh. If I go down from here. This is text for activity D and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Do this is text for activity E and describes what this activity is and what it is about. Dollar ten thousand point oh oh. So it's reading the whole row, uh, even though I'm positioned in the column on the right. But that's fine because I'm able to go from cell to cell, as I mentioned. Activity. This is text for activity E and describe cost. Dollar ten thousand point oh oh. So everything is spatially laid out very neatly. And it makes a way more sense. <laughs> so creating accessible lists. Now we have gone through styles, we've gone through headings, and we've gone through tables. Again, it's been an introduction. I hope that you're learning some things. This next important accessibility feature for your document is properly formatted lists. So when creating lists, do not make lists with just manually typed characters like dashes, numbers, asterisks, or graphics. Yes, I have seen people use graphics for lists. Don't do it, please. Um, use the appropriate button in Word's uh, formatting toolbar, so direct formatting. And I'm going to show you in the demo how to do this, so don't worry. Remember what I said back at the beginning about direct formatting? Yep. This is one of those times, guys. Um, for lists, there are two types. There's unordered, which is bulleted, and there's ordered, which is numbers or letters, and or letters. You can do a combination of both, actually. Um, what's also the difference between an ordered and an unordered list? An unordered list means that the um, order that the list is in, um, it doesn't matter. It can be reordered and it doesn't lose meaning. An ordered list means that the order that the list is in, if you reorder it, it loses meaning. So like, um, you know, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do something and you have to do A, B, C, then you want it to be A, B, C, or one, two, three. Okay, that's an ordered list. We recommend that if you have a multi-leveled list, nested list, then use ordered list for formatting. It's just more accessible for Word. Um, when you make a list using direct formatting, it will cause a list paragraph style to appear in the style panes. If mod case modifications are needed, such as spacing or fonts, do this in the modify style, not by using direct formatting. Okay, so we're only using direct formatting to create the list. All right, so we're going to go back to our favorite analyst, Kai, and he is going to show us uh, about what it's like for a bad list and a screen reader. Next, let's talk about making lists accessible. The first example is a bad example where paragraph breaks are used. Item one, page four, item two, item three. The screen reader is able to read the text, but it's unable to determine that it's a list thereby preventing the user from getting additional context. 
Thank you, Kai. Next, let's. And then it's that time again, guys. We're going to go into a live demo. All right, let's go down the list. So we are going to insert a list. It is fairly simple. I want to make sure that I'm on my home tab and that I have this direct formatting section here. I have on my screen, I have item one, item two, item three. It, they are separated by paragraphs. And as we just saw, that doesn't work for screen readers or accessibility. So I'm going to highlight those items, pretty straightforward. And then I'm going to make an unordered list first, OK? So I'm going to go up here, and there's this button that has a little bulleted list on it. And I'm going to select it. Bob's your uncle. We got an unordered list. Then you notice there's this list paragraph here in my style pane that I can modify if I choose. Also notice that there is a little arrow beside when you go over the button. If I open that, it opens up a pop-up menu and it shows me the bullets, right? Now you could use like these sort of like clear bullets um, I have also seen people do it, have it set up. So it's a list, it's formatted as a list, but there's no actual visible bullets. Lists are also there for people who use Zoom text or people who have um, other perceptual or reading disabilities other than using a screen reader or Zoom. So stuff like, like, like cognitive or, and like dyslexia and stuff like that. So adding those bullets, will also show that it's a list and that can add an extra level of accessibility, okay? So adding the list does two things. It gives the markup. Remember we we're talking about marking up the, the headings. It's gonna mark up this text as a list for the screen reader. And it's also gonna show people who use Zoom or people who also have cognitive or other reading disabilities that this is in fact a list. Okay, so that's what we recommend. So now I'm gonna do an ordered list. Same thing, item one, item two, item three. I'm just gonna highlight it. I'm gonna go up to the top here. The button beside the unordered, which is called bullets in Microsoft Word, is numbering. I'm gonna click numbering, so much magic. All right, and again, if we open up that little arrow on numbering, we can see that we have different styles. We can do Roman numerals, we can do alphabets, we can do lowercase, uppercase. This is okay, because these are all visual. So you can use those. So you can do Roman numerals. Yes, screen readers know the difference between an Arabic number and a Roman number. They're gonna read them the same. So go for the glory, all right? I'm gonna change these to Roman. So next, I'm going to go through a nested ordered list. Remember how I said earlier that if you're going to do a nested multi-layered list, we want you to use numbering. We want to use numbers, orders, ordered, numbered letters. OK, so again, I'm going to select it all. I'm going to hit my little number button for lists. And then under item one, I have item 1A and item 1B, and I want this to be nested under item one. So the way I do that, there's two ways. And first, I'm going to highlight it. I can either press the tab key on my mouse, oh no, sorry, my mouse, on my keyboard, and indents, and it's going to change it to like A, B. Okay, it automatically changes it for you. Or I'm going to just undo that. Or I can go up again to my direct formatting buttons. And if I go three buttons over from the numbering, okay, we've got the multi-level list, which is another option you can use is a bit more advanced option. Um, but I can go increase indent. So I hit increase indent and there you go. So let's do that again for the next one. I've got item two item 2A, item 2B, I'm gonna highlight that and then I'm gonna increase indent, okay? And that is how you create lists.
fairly straightforward, okay? I'm gonna go back to Kai, okay? And he's gonna show us now what a good list is like. And then I am anxious for your questions, All right? Let's see what Kai has to show us. When we go to the example that has been marked up as a list, this is what it'll sound like. Level one, bullet item one, four, six. Bullet item two, bullet item three, level zero, level. I'm able to not only read the text, but understand that this is a single level list, meaning that there's no nested items within this list. And depending on how the screen reader is set up and the screen reader itself, it may also announce how many items are in the list. Now let's look at a nested list. Level one, one, item one, one of three. Level two, A, item one A, B, item one B. Level one, two, item two. Level two, A, item two A, B, item two B. Level one, three, item three. Level zero, heading level one, level. So as you can tell, the screener is able to read everything within this list and able to announce the different level changes, which tells me as a user that under each item, there are two sub items. So that makes it a lot easier to mentally visualize and to determine how the list is laid out. We're going to go to applying languages. Turn my spotlight back on. All right. We are on a roll. Thank you for staying with me throughout this presentation. So our next accessibility feature is something that can be often overlooked and its languages. Now, whenever there is a text in another language, it's very important to properly mark up the language in, of the, that word or phrase in the Word document. And is this so a screen reader can properly pronounce the words and phrases? Language that is not marked up is impossible to understand, okay? So you can check the language by selecting the word or phrase and looking at the bottom bar of the word screen as seen in the screenshot on the slide. Don't worry, guys, I'm gonna show this to you when I do my demo too, all right? So let's just go back to Kai quickly and he's gonna show us what it's like to read a language that isn't marked up properly. Next, let's talk about language tagging. It's really important to tag phrases and text in a document with the correct language when you're dealing with multiple languages. Not only is this semantically more correct, but this allows the screen reader to understand what the language is and apply the correct accent. So let's look at the bad example where the French is not properly tagged with a French tag. Set phrase as state right and francaise, less lands, puven, dead or delicates. I'm currently listening to it using the English American accent, which doesn't really make much sense. All right, thank you, Kai. Let's, Next, uh, let's talk about oops. language. Let's go into our demo and show how we can fix this. All right, languages. Very exciting. All right, so here I have some phrases. I have this phrase up here is not marked up. This phrase here is marked up. I'm gonna show you how I know that and then I'm gonna show you how to do it, okay? So first, how do I know that? Well, one thing is you, my um, autocorrect is on, well, not my autocorrect, but my grammar and spell check is on in my word. So it's showing me these little red squiggly lines that we all know mean something's misspelled. It's not misspelled, it's in French, but it's in English. It has no French markup. So the document thinks it's English, okay? So another thing is, remember I mentioned that little tip in the screen, the slide before? If I put my cursor on one of these French phrases that isn't marked up. And I go to the lower left corner of my entire document, the very bottom bar. We've got page, right now I'm on page four of seven. 
number of words, tells me if there's any proofing errors, and then it says language English, okay? So I know that that phrase is English. Now, if I go down to the one that is marked up and I select it, notice how now it changed to French. So that's pretty exciting. So I'm actually gonna remove that. Clear formatting, then you know, it's a little red line showed up and then it went back to English. So now let's, let's apply this, okay? This is gonna be a little different than some of the things I've showed before, but it's actually really easy. So don't worry about it. We're gonna to go to the very, very top menu here, okay? For view word. We're not in the ribbon, we're at the top one for word. We're gonna to go to tools. So file, edit, view, insert format tools. We're gonna to open up the drop down menu, okay? We're going to go down to language. We're gonna select language. This is gonna open up a dialog box for language. You will notice that right now there's a display and it says mark to select text, mark select text as. We've got English Canadian, English US, and there's gonna be like a hard line. And then there is an alphabet, alphabetical, ooh, words, alphabetical list. These are all the languages that come with Microsoft Word. Now, some older versions of Word don't have all of these. Um, there are ways you can upload languages. Um, I'm not gonna go through it for this presentation. Okay, that's a bit more advanced, but I'm gonna show you how to apply a language. So we, have, we know that this is a French phrase. So I'm gonna scroll down until I find French. I'm gonna use French Canada because that's where we are. I'm just gonna select it so it's highlighted and then I'm gonna hit okay. And then two things happened. First, all the little red squiggly lines appeared and then down the bottom, it says French again. Okay, so let's do that one more time for this phrase. I'm gonna highlight this phrase, okay, boom. Looking down at the bottom left corner here, it says English. Okay, I'm gonna go up to my top menu for Word. I'm gonna go over to tools. I'm gonna to open up my tool menu. I'm gonna scroll down to language. Open up my language dialog box. Now, because I've already used a language in this document, it's gonna be up at the top, which makes life a little fun. But even if it wasn't there, I can still scroll down and find it. But it's right at the top there. So I'm gonna hit French Canada. I'm gonna hit okay. And then again, we notice no more red squiggly lines and now it's French Canadian. All right, just a quick little aside about languages. If the language is, um, if it's like a proper name or a scientific term, don't mark it up because that would just be confusing. If it is um, what they call, they call it naturalized, but basically like, you know, like words like rendezvous, we don't mark that up in French because it's what they consider naturalized. I have some links in the resources if you wanna discover more about accessibility and language. Um, that all being said, if there is a phrase and you want, you need to mark it up, this is how you mark it up. So we're gonna go back to Kai really quickly and he's gonna demonstrate what it's like now to read this with the proper marked up language and then I'll get to any of your questions. When I listen to it again with the language tag properly applied to French, it'll now use the proper accent. Cette phrase est écrite en français, les langues peuvent être délicates. Sounds a lot better. So the takeaway for this is to remember to apply language tags so that the screen reader can use the proper accents. So now we are going to go into hyperlinks. We are more than halfway through. So we're going to shift to hyperlinks and we're going to keep on going. If you have the URL as the display text for a hyperlink, 
the screen reader or text-to-speech program cannot, will read it out one letter at a time, okay? So if the URL is a display text, it will read it out, like www, blah, blah, blah. Very annoying, not accessible at all. So we wanna switch the language of the display text to some, something that's plain, clear, and direct. When adding display text, also avoid phrases like click here, learn more. Something as simple as, for instance, Nell's website um, is a good example of simple, clear, direct phrasing for a hyperlink. Okay, so we're gonna go back to Kai and he's gonna show us what this is like. Now let's talk about links. What you want for links is to be able to properly label them so that the screen reader user understands where the link will take them without listening to the entire link itself since it can get very verbose. When a link is not labeled properly, this is what it'll sound like. This example is created by the wonderful people at NNELS link HTTPS slash slash nels.com slash this example is created. So we read the whole URL. So yeah, I read the whole URL and that's just, that's not what we want. Now let's talk. About so let's go into our demo and let's go on how to fix this issue. Okay. So I'm going to go down to hyperlinks. Now, just a little caveat before I get into this is people who rely on screen readers often browse a list of a document's links to kind of get an idea of the content. So even in a document, a web page, an article, screen readers can just browse through the links. So if the display text for all those links is the same generic phrase, it could sound something like, click here, click here, click here, click here, link, 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 link. That doesn't really mean anything, okay? So you can include a phrase like, now, but don't worry, you can include a phrase like learn more at or go here in the surrounding text around your display text, as long as you ensure that the actual display text of the link is meaningful, clear, and direct. So let's get started. Here I have an example, and right now it's set to the naughty display text. So we are going to select the link you wish to edit. We're going to do the magic right click, open up that pop up window. We're going to go down to hyperlink, edit hyperlink. Now I know in different versions of Word, not just for Windows and Mac, but also different versions of Word, this might look differently. What you want to get to is edit hyperlink. Okay, it might not be a, a open, it might actually just say edit hyperlink here, but hyperlink, edit hyperlink is where you want to end up. Okay. So we're going to open edit hyperlink and it's going to open up the dialog box for edit hyperlink. There's a couple of things going on on this page, but the only thing that we're worried about is the display text. It's at the text box at the very top. It says this text display right now it's set as the actual URL and I don't want that. So again, remember we're talking about something clear, concise, direct. All right. I know this is the website for where I work, nels.ca. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just literally change it to Nels website. And I'm gonna hit okay. Now, remember how I said a little earlier, you can do some surrounding text if you wanna make this a little more verbose. You know, you can put like learn more at Nell's website, all right? And it's that simple, all right? You can also have it just sitting on its own like that. You can have it in a list. It's like, depending on how the information is being presented, but that displays text always has to be something very simple, very clear, very direct. So now that I've shown you how to fix the display text for, we're gonna go back to our beloved Kai, and he's gonna show us how awesome this is. When we add a proper label to this link. This example is created by the wonderful people from NNELS. Link, use simple clear language for hyperlink, heading level period. 
Heading level one text dot link language for hyper. Then we have something that's a little bit more concise, and the user is still able to understand that this is a link. Thank you, Kai. Now we are getting into the realm of images, OK? All images need to be set in line with text so the screen reader can locate them. We're going to demonstrate this shortly, so you'll see what I mean. Um, if there are captions, they need to be formatted correctly so the screen reader can identify them with the image, OK? So on here, I have a screenshot of an image with a proper reformatted caption. I will be showing you how to create this in a live demo, and I will be showing you the image description for this image in the live demo. So just hold on for that excitement. So that brings me to alternative text and image description. So again, images are essential part of reading. Everyone deserves to have access to a full reading experience. We use the term alternative text or alt text to replace the image with text, okay? A screener will pick up the image descriptions you place in the alt text box in Word. Again, I'm gonna demo this for you guys, so I got you. All images must have meaningful alt text. I'm gonna repeat that, okay? All images must have meaningful alt text, and we will tell you what that means, so don't worry. We recommend that alt text be around two to six sentences long. If you have complex descriptions, such as maps, graphs, and charts, you may need a long description, but I don't think you'll come across it very often as a library staff, but it is something to know about. There is a set of best practices and guidelines to teach you how to write meaningful alt text, including accessible publishing. Um, and we're gonna share that link with you in the chat. And it's also in the slide. Um, that offers a great beginner's guide. And you can also see the resources for more, okay? Now these are, trust me when I say these are great resource guides. I use them in my own training. I use them in my own education and I share them with other people and I still use them today. So it's gonna really help you. So now I'm gonna go over briefly alt text writing, okay? Now I train and teach people on how to write alt text as a core part of my job. And I like to describe it as a mixture of creative writing and technical writing. There is no way I can fully teach you about how to write image descriptions in this presentation, but here is an overview of the main points to keep in mind when you're writing. And trust me, this is a great place to start, okay? You wanna write white descriptions with the clear structure. So our friend Kai likes to describe this. Kai is also an alt, alt description expert. And one of the ways he describes this through training is imagine you're entering a room with someone who is blind and you're going to describe that room to them, okay? That's going to help you kind of learn what structure is. Um, you open the door, you say it's an office, and there's a window on the opposite wall. Then you literally walk through the room, and you describe things as they come, right? Also, the idea is you start with, like, a summarizing sentence, and then you get more detail, more detail, more detail, okay? You write descriptions based on context. When I say context, I mean, if you're writing a description for kids, you're gonna be using different language than if you're writing a description for like, you know, university students, okay? You write for your audience, that links back up to context. You aim for conciseness. Use present tense and action verbs. Now I know again, some people get really stuck on this present tense and action verbs. And I find in training, the best way for me to explain this is write like it's actually happening, right? It's you're in the present, it's actually happening. That's how you write your description. And the reason we recommend this is because all study and feedback shows that this just makes it easier to understand, okay? Write out abbreviations. 
be objective. So only write what you see. Don't write your interpretation of what you see because you want the reader to have their own interpretation. Do not censor. If you're ever in a situation where you can't describe an image because it offends you for some reason, I know in our workshops, we use a image of a Greek urn that has, you know, genitalia being shown. Um, you need to describe that genitalia. If you're not comfortable, have a, another staff member do it. Um, but we don't censor. Okay. Text with images need to be written out. I'm going to show you exactly how that, what that looks like and how to do it. So don't worry about that. I got you. I know a lot of library staff have images with text. Okay. And don't rely on the captions. Again, there'll be a list of resources on how to write alt text at the end of this presentation. And they are wonderful resources, guys. And I use them all the time for myself and in my training. So now let's go back to Kai and he's gonna show us what it's like to go to an image that isn't formatted correctly and doesn't have proper alt text. Now let's talk about how to make your images accessible using alt text. Alt text is a text description that's equivalent for a blind or low vision reader so that they can understand what is in the photo. Below are three images. The first is not properly lined with the text and the caption is not styled properly. There's also no alt text except for the one that's generated by Microsoft's AI. When, when I arrow down to try to find it, it completely skips over it because of how it's oriented and how it's formatted. So let's see if we can find it. Not below heading left below are three and not styled properly. When, a cat with a flower on its head description automatically generated image 8.61 centimeters wide by 12.9 centimeters high text wrapping square. So you can hear the automatically generated description and you can see that nothing is styled properly okay thank you kai so let's get to the now live let's demo talk about how to make and i'm going to format an image and i'm going to insert captions i'm going to go down to images all right so first thing i'm going to show you the formatting and then i'm going to go over uh, alt text Okay, so here's my image. This one is not formatted properly. So first I'm going to select the image. I know the image is selected because it has the guides around it and there's this little anchor icon beside it. Okay, so my image is selected and I wanna make it in line with text, all right? So I'm going to right click, that magical right click. I'm gonna go down to wrap text and I'm gonna make it in line with text, okay? So now it is gonna be in the position that where the screen reader will be able to find it. And also when you edit around this image, it's not gonna like jump around. You know, when you're like trying to like do things in Word and your images go crazy and go into weird places, it's because they're not in line with text. They're kind of like floating a bit. This is gonna help avoid that. Now I'm gonna take this, text here. I'm just going to cut it. And I'm going to use that as my caption. Okay, so this is how it's the same as I showed you before with tables. So we're going to select the image. We're going to right click, open the menu. We're going to go to insert caption. It opens up our caption dialog box. Now I'm position all captions for images go below selected item. So position is set to below selected item. I want, right now my default for labels is table, figure, and equation, but I don't like that. I want photo. So I'm gonna go to new label, which is right underneath the drop down for table. It's a button saying new label. I'm gonna click that. Really simple, dialog box, new label, text box, marked label and I'm going to write photo. I'm going to hit OK and that's it. And then if I want to delete it, I can just hit delete label. So now I'm going to put in my caption, put in a colon space. This is a caption. OK. And I'm going to hit OK. And there it is. 
And then remember how we can modify styles. I'm just gonna do that quickly though too to remind you how to do it. So we're in our style pane. We're gonna to go to caption. We're gonna to go to that little arrow on the far right. I'm gonna open up, select modify style. And all I'm gonna do here for modify style is I'm gonna change to automatic and I'm gonna change the text to 11. And I'm gonna take off the italics. I'm gonna hit automatically update because I want it to automatically update and I'm gonna hit okay. And now my caption is like that. And if I go up to my tables, I'll notice that the caption style um, also changed right there. Okay. So that is how we format a picture. Let's talk about alt text, okay? So here is my image. Um, Remember earlier, we heard that weird little thing about a cat with flower on its head, description automatically generated. So Word has this built-in function um, where it will automatically generate um, alt text. Never rely on AI to do your image descriptions because it will do this time. Okay, I've seen some really funny ones and I wish I could have dug up some really funny ones for this presentation. Um, but this one says a cat with a flower on its head. So it got one thing, right? It's a cat, but it's got a butterfly on its nose. So we wanna be better than that. So how do we enter alt text? Okay, so I select the image and I right click and I go to edit alt text. Now, again, these steps might be a little different if you have a different version of Word um, or if you're using a PC, but don't worry, we will be pro providing su supporting documentation on that, okay? So when you open the alt text box, it's gonna be on the same area as your style pane. You now have two tabs, you have styles and you have alt text. There's this little piece of text here that talks to you about how to write alt text. The directions are gonna be slightly different than what I've been giving you. And that's just because Microsoft Word is a little bit behind the curve when it comes to community input. So I already have some pre-written um, description here. And I wrote a cat with a butterfly sitting on the tip of its nose. The cat sits outside in the setting sun. The cat has long hair and is white with gray spots. The butterfly is small blue butterfly with black tip wings. So that is an example of really good alt text. So we're gonna cut that. We're gonna go back up to our image. Now notice that like my alt text box stays open but it goes black when I'm not on the image. When I select the image, it goes gray and that's where my alt text is. So I make sure I select the image and then I just put the alt text in there. I'm just gonna paste it in. So now this image has alt text. So I'm gonna do that one more time from the beginning for you guys, just so you can see it. Again, I have an image here. I'm gonna select the image, I'm gonna right click, edit alt text, open up my alt text, make sure that the image is selected, and then I can enter alt text here. Also note that alt text, you can't do paragraphs. You can only do punctuation. So punctuation is your friend for creating pauses, okay? And then I told you I was gonna show you um, a image uh, with text in it, because I know a lot of librarians do use that. And this is an example actually from a library, okay? So I wrote this very quick alt text here. And just to show you how to deal with quoting text, okay? So it's an open book laying on a table. The pages of the book are slightly raised. White text above the book reads, colon, in quotation marks. Then I have the actual quotes with a period and then the author, okay? So you write, re text reads, text says, colon, and then the actual text in quotation marks. So that's the standard. So again, I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna go back up to my alt text. I'm gonna select that image. So I know I'm putting it in the right place. I'm gonna paste it there. And now that has alt text. 
Okay, so that was a very quick overview of image descriptions. We're just gonna go back to Kai quickly and we're gonna see the big difference it makes to actually have good images. And then I will take your questions. Let's take a look at good alt text. Quick keys on. Page six, picture a cat with a butterfly sitting on the tip of its nose. The cat sits outside in the setting sun. The cat has long hair and is white with gray spots. The butterfly is a small blue butterfly with black tipped wings. Photo one, this is a good caption. So you can tell the description is way better because it's produced by a human and everything is properly styled. Let's take a look at the next image that is also really great with good uh, image descriptions. An open book laying on the table. The pages of the book are slightly raised. White text above the book reads. The only thing you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. Albert Einstein image. Photo two example of an image with text. So again, great description. And in this example, the person writing the alt text included the text that's part of the image because that text is unable to be picked up normally by a screen reader. So the main takeaway is to remember to add alt text preferably by human. In fact, uh, I strongly recommend using a human to write alt text because even though AI is slowly getting better, it's still far from being able to provide great image descriptions. Okay, so we're just gonna go through some other things pretty quickly, and then I'm gonna talk about word checker, okay? So now we'll go briefly over some other considerations to keep in mind as you work towards creating your accessible document. So this has been a brief introduction to creating accessible documents and we could not go through everything, but we did want to include some other important considerations when creating an accessible document word for PDF or just in general, okay? Use the developer tab to create accessible forms. We could not have an entire presentation on accessible forms, but you know, maybe we will. Linked on the slide is, and in the resource sections, and it's also gonna go into the chat, is a great guide on how to get started with accessible forms in Word. It was created by the University of Sussex. I went through it and it's, it's, it's fairly well organized. Um, so that can help get you started with doing accessible forms. Um, don't put information in the header or footer. And if you need to, make sure it's repeated in the body text. Screen readers will not read header and footer information. Um, and again, don't use tables as layouts. Quick thing about fonts. Fonts you choose are very important. The most common fonts that are considered accessible are sans serif. And we've included some popular sans serif on this slide. For font size, it's recommended to have a minimum of 11 points. I don't know if anyone noticed when I was reformatting the captions, but I changed the font size to 11, and that is why. As we did this, because this is the smallest size that is scalable for readers using Zoom. And the most accessible sizes that we recommend using are between 12 and 16 points. Okay. Color. Do not use color to convey only visual meaning. The biggest thing to consider when using color is the contrast. So be aware and also be aware of color blindness. Color contrast refers to the contrast between the text and the background on display. Too much or too litter contrast can cause both problems. Think about trying to read colored text with a low contrast, like a gray text on a white background. We recommend setting all colors to automatic to ensure the most accessibility. I do know this is not necessarily something you can do if you have a template, um, but this is just something to consider, maybe a recommendation moving forward. Um, you can use the accessibility checker, which I'm gonna show you how to do in a couple of minutes here to analyze the document to find insufficient color contrast. Um, and there's also resources in the slides. I'm sorry guys that I have to go through that so quickly, but. There's a lot that we could talk about, and we do are we are going to give you all supporting information about that. So now that we've gone through the basics of creating your document, it's time to learn how to check your documents. Um, so once you've created your accessible document, you can run through the accessible checker in Word. 
This easy step will tell you if there are any accessibility errors in your document and help you fix them. So it's actually like really easy to use. Um, and it can address accessibility areas and warnings and recommended actions. Um, you can apply a one click fix by selecting an action or select the arrow button um, next to the action. I'm going to show you how to do this, so don't worry. We recommend that you check out Microsoft Accessibility Rules for Accessibility Checker for more information. Um, we'll also include a link um, and the resources slides at the end. So we're just going to dive right into a demo now, okay, guys? And I'm going to show you how to do this accessibility checker, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the review tab on the uh, ribbon menu. And there should be a button that says accessibility checker. Again, in certain versions of Word, some of the older versions of Word might not even have this. It's always good to make sure that you have an updated version of Word whenever possible. Um, so if there is a variation with this, don't worry. I, we will be sending you supporting documentation, OK? Again, this little button, accessibility checker, there's a little icon of a person that looks like they're doing the jumping jacks. They're just excited about accessibility. All right, so I hit it and then the accessibility checker pops up in a window again to the right of my screen. Um, it's an additional tab with the alt text and styles. I have some warnings. I have a reading order warning in my table, which is fine because we know that this table is horribly made. <laughs> um, so that's fine. Um, if I deleted this table, it would go away. Boom, gone. Um, then we have hard to read text. Okay, so then I click that and it actually will show me where the text contract is and I can click it and it will highlight for me in the document what that is. If you notice down here, it actually also tells me how to fix it. Okay, so I have my warnings, hard to read text contracts, takes me to where it is and then it can tell me at the bottom here how to fix it. Um, and that's a color contrast thing. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm just honestly, I'm just gonna clear formatting, right? Um, and make it normal text and go back to my accessibility checker. No accessibility issues were found. People with disabilities should not have difficulty reading this document, all right? Remember another thing you can do if you wanna stay, change color is you can modify the style, right? And you can change the color and the formatting right here. And remember, we do recommend automatic whenever possible. Okay, so that is the quick way to do an accessibility checker. Um, one thing I do want to note is that this is, again, not perfect. Um, it is automatic. It will find most of the things that are an issue. Um, you can also have it open while you're working. And it will just kind of like tell you when you do something wrong. Um, I don't like doing that personally because I find it distracting. I like to do it at the end of my workflow and fix things. And again, that link that we, sh we share with you about the rules, it will walk you through everything. So it's, it's a fairly user-friendly application. All righty. So I'm just going to go over briefly uh, accessible PDFs. And then we are at the finish line. So brief introduction to accessible PDFs. PDFs are a popular type of document in a lot of our workflows. Um, so this is gonna be a brief introduction on how to properly convert your Word document to an accessible PDF because there is a way to do it wrong and you don't wanna lose all this amazing work you just did. So what is an accessible PDF? Well, I shall tell you, an accessible PDF is simply a PDF that has been tagged correctly to enable a screener to read the information in an order that makes sense to the user. Okay, it's, it's, the same, it's pretty much the same definition as an accessibility Word document. If you start with Word, follow the guidelines and best practices for creating an accessible document and properly convert that document to PDF, most of the tagging will transfer. And I know you guys don't want to hear that, but PDFs, even though they have come a long way, they're still not perfect. Um, 
But if you start with a Word document, it will save you a lot of time. I do recommend that you still run through the PDF accessibility checker um, and possibly manual fix a few tags that did not convert properly. And I will take you through that right now. Um, first, I want to talk about tools. So part of creating accessible documents is using the correct tools. And again, I know we're limited to what we're, we can use depending on the budget or what we have available to us within an organization, but it is Adobe Acrobat Pro that's been, that is the best for creating accessibility at this time um, for PDFs. There is a link in the resource section that goes over other software that you can also use. Um, so just be aware of that. There's a whole section of the resources on PDFs. So the reason Adobe Acrobat Pro is good is it follows the PDF accessibility standard. It has that built-in checker that's very similar to the word checker. And um, so it, it's, and it's fairly user-friendly. Um, we don't have time to go through all the steps on how to check and fix accessibility tags in Adobe Pro, but their website um, offers user-friendly and thorough documentation that you can find on the next slide. And we're also gonna share this in the chat, okay? So you have created your accessible document, Word document, and now you want it to be an accessible PDF. It's quick and easy to convert a Word document to PDF. It depends on your operating system and your version of Word. Now, again, guys, a lot of you aren't going to see the same thing I do because it really does vary. But we have um, the link on the slide um, includes directions for Mac, Windows, and multiple versions of Words on how to do what I'm going to demo for you. OK, so. As we mentioned earlier on in the beginning of this presentation, the markup you create in Word would tra will translate most of the time to accessibility tabs in PDF, okay? So my final demo, I'm just gonna walk you through this. And again, don't panic if you don't have the same version of me, we're gonna show you how to do this with the supporting documentation, okay? This is the one step that is the most different. So if you're on a Mac, you want to go to save as. You can press command shift S. You type in the name. Okay. In the save as dialog box. Then you go to the file format drop down menu at the bottom here and you select PDF, okay? Then there's a radio button that says best for electronic distribution and accessibility. And you wanna make sure that radio button is selected. Now again, in the many versions of Word, this saving is very different. The one key takeaway is that every time you save as a PDF, there will be a place where you can make sure that it is um, converting to an accessible PDF, okay? And again, we're gonna give you that supporting documentation, but just make sure that you have those proper things selected no matter what version you're using. And then you hit export. And you will have a better version of PDF than if you didn't do it that way. And plus all the work that you just did in this wonderful Word document will not go to waste at all when it goes to PDF. So that's super exciting. So I've got some final thoughts. Thank you so much guys for coming along this journey with me for accessible documents. Once you know the steps on how to make your documents accessible, it's easy to include this into your document creation workflow. If you follow these top recommendations for remediating and creating um, your documents, your workflow for accessible document creation um, will be on the way to be more equitable and inclusive across the world. We're, we're, we're in this together, guys. We understand that a lot of you work with templates. So if you follow the guidelines in this presentation, you can create an accessible template to simplify the process of remediation. Um, remediation meaning going back and fixing documents or even creating new documents in the future as well. 
Starting with an accessible Word document is the best way to create an accessible PDF and born accessible documents are always the best and easiest to work with. I just wanna take the time to thank all of you for attending this presentation and a deep thank you to all the wonderful people working on accessible libraries that have helped me bring this information to you today.